Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is March 30th and we are uh, continuing our deliberation on S7, which is an act relating to expanding access to expungement, sealing of criminal records. And um, in terms of our agenda, um, we will be getting written testimony from, from James Pepper um, and um, as well as John Jones. and. Uh, but I'd like to start with um, with Erica Reddick, who uh, is um, a citizen of Vermont, who is going to tell us her her story. Um, my understanding is a very compelling story. She did testify to uh, to the Senate. Um, so welcome, and thank you, thank you so much for for reaching out and uh, for for sharing your story um, with us, because it's always it's always so so helpful. Um, so, um, so go ahead. Um, the, um, um, do, you know, state your name for the record, and then um, glad to um, hear your testimony. And then please let us know if you would um, take questions. Great. So, um, all right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Grad. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to chat with y'all and make sure I'm on, not muted or anything. Uh, my name is Erica Redick. Uh, that's R E D I C for the record. Um, and I'm happy to take questions after. Um, I am really excited about this bill, <laughs> obviously, because um, I would get to benefit from it. Um, back in 2005, I was struggling with drug addiction. And during that time, uh, I decided that it was a great idea to steal money from my employer to support that habit. Um, and because I am an accountant by trade, I was in a position where, you know, I had bosses that basically didn't pay attention to anything. And I had access to the money, to checking accounts and to all of those things. And so, uh, you know, in the middle of that insanity, um, to support my habit, I started stealing money, um, to support it. And luckily, gratefully, I was caught within six months of the first time I cut myself a check and was arrested and charged with felony embezzlement. I uh, was convicted in 2006. So I pleaded, you know, not guilty to begin with. So you get to do the plea deal. And then in 2006, I pleaded guilty because I was and I wanted to take responsibility for what I did. And uh, so I served time at the Windsor State Correctional Facility and was released uh, later that year and was on probation until my restitution was paid in full. So one of the conditions that the judge ordered, which I think was very reasonable and fair, it's, this is not a complaint, was that my probation was indefinite until I satisfied all the conditions of my release. And as long as I didn't reoffend and all of those other things. So my sentence was actually two to five years, all suspended, but 90 days, probation indefinite till I paid things off. Um, again, I, I will say over and over and over again that I'm grateful that I got arrested. I am grateful to that I went to jail, which is a crazy thing to say. Um, but it was really a wake up call and I, my cellmates were in for murder and attempted murder. Like there were five of us in one cell. It was overcrowded murder, attempted murder. And I just saw, you know, what my life will look like, would look like if I continued down the same path. And so, um, I got out, I started to, uh, put my life back together, you know, getting whatever job I could get. And that was really hard. And it sucked. Uh, just like everybody tells you that it does, uh, because a felony conviction, it does not matter what you did. Felony means a very specific thing. So it doesn't matter that, you know, what I did was nonviolent and I'm sorry, just so you know, I'm looking at my camera. So if you're trying to get my attention, just say something out loud. Um, so it, it means a very specific thing to people. And it doesn't matter what the circumstances were. It doesn't matter that 
uh, had I been able to advocate for myself or had my family been able to afford an attorney to advocate on my behalf, it could have been a misdemeanor. Um, but the, the victim wanted the book thrown at me and understandably so. Um, I, I do not begrudge them that. They wanted justice and they deserved it. I harmed them. Um, but that carrying around that label 15 years later um, 16 years later is, is still very challenging for my husband and I. So, um, I am very grateful that I was given a second opportunity at my career, uh, an accounting firm in Burlington gave me a second chance and I went back to college. I finished my degree. I got sober. My sobriety date is March 20th, 2009. So I just celebrated 12 years, um, and so we put all of these pieces back together. I went back to college and I finished my degree. I've started my own business. I now help other businesses uh, be successful. My husband has his business and I support him. We're landlords in Burlington and we support our community. I mean, I have a police officer who is one of my tenants uh, who's awesome because we want to make sure that we are supporting our first responders. So I'm really have all these opportunities to get back, give back to the community, but I, I can't run for office uh, like I would like to, because you can't, with a felony conviction, you can't be supported by parties. Um, we get denied housing. So my husband is a, is a filmmaker and his business is in Texas. So we have to maintain a residence in Texas as well. 15 years later, we're still discriminated against in housing because I have a felony conviction. And again, it does not matter what's on there. Um, there are job opportunities or uh, opportunities to work with different clients that I cannot take because I have a felony conviction. And again, it just doesn't matter. Um, I've applied for a governor's pardon. Uh, his, it has been on Governor Scott's desk for almost three years now, and he will not look at it. And I have been told repeatedly that Vermont governors do not give pardons. So there is this, um, there is this appearance of an opportunity for redemption for people like me that doesn't actually exist. It's it's not real. It is just that an appearance of of redemption. And so when I heard, uh, you know, I had talked to this about this with Senator Joe Benning. And he let me know that there was an opportunity that the Vermont legislature was looking for opportunities to expand and said, you are the exact perfect person we need to hear from for why this is important. So um, I feel like I could just go on and on and on, but I'll stop talking and um, am happy to take any questions that anyone has at all. Um, I, 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 I do not carry uh, any guilt or shame around this. And I'm always happy when I get the opportunity to use my experience to help other people, whether it's helping other women get sober or helping the Vermont House Judiciary Committee decide whether or not they want to pass S7. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And congratulations on all the, on all the progress that you made. And, uh, and I understand why why it's so difficult, you know, having come as far as as you as you have, and I yeah. will thank Senator Benning um, for uh, inviting you in the Senate and for um, making sure that that we've heard from you. Mm -hmm. um, have you tried um, a petition to the court in the interest of judge uh, justice? It's sort of a catch-all that um, that has been successful at times. Um, I'm not certain what that is. I, okay. I'm not, I haven't heard that. I did, I was encouraged to apply for an expungement in 2015 and I'd have to go back and look at my records. I was told to apply for an expungement, even though my crime wasn't eligible, just to see if they would do it or consider it. And it was denied by now Attorney General um, T.J. Donovan, that then District Attorney, I think that was his title, uh, or State's Attorney, um, for, he denied it for some reason other than why he should have denied it, which was like the time period or something like that. 
Um, so the petition you're talking about, I'm not clear if that's something different. Yeah, well, why don't we can talk off offline. Um, sure. Yeah, um, but in the meantime, let's get working on this bill. <laughs> um, Barbara. Thank you so much for Erica for sharing your story. Yes, um, so I'm wondering, um, you said you're grateful that you got arrested. Do you think if you hadn't been caught, you, I mean, what do you think would have happened? And I'm curious if something different would have had the same impact on you without having that felony uh, front and center for you forever until something changes. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So um, do I think anything other than being arrested would have helped me get sober and change my life? Is that the question? Right, and right, yes. Okay. And I just want to make sure I'm, I'm covering yeah. everything. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so, so there's, I have two parts to that. Um, n yes and no. So no, I don't think anything other than getting arrested. Well, let me rephrase that. Being arrested and having to take responsibility for what I did was an integral part of my recovery. So yes, there are other things that were necessary for me to recover. So getting arrested, going to jail and doing all of that stuff is, is just a part of the recovery. So one of the ways that what I tell people, especially, you know, I'm a part of a 12 step program. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people that I know that are successful in their recovery are part of a 12 step program. And part of that is owning what you've done, taking responsibility and suffering whatever consequences are necessary right. with dignity. Right. And that is the way that is one of the ways that I was able to earn my dignity back and I was able to earn my integrity back. That is a very integral part of the process. Um, I think that if you rob someone of the opportunity, funny to use that language, but um, if you rob someone of that opportunity to really take responsibility and ownership for what they've done, there's a gap in the process of recovery. Um, that was not the only thing that was required. Um, I tell people all of the time um, that people have to help people recover. There is no government program. There's no, uh, no, no service you can provide. There's no committee you can create that will help people get sober. It requires other people taking an interest in that person's life to help them get sober. So one of the main things that helped me get sober was Colleen Montgomery of Montgomery. They're now called Montgomery and Grand Eye. I know her. Mind, yeah. I, she I doesn't know mind. Her. Yeah. Okay. So she doesn't mind me sharing the, this story. Um, you know, Colleen Montgomery knew me because I was friends with her daughter. And she called me and she said, Erica, I want to give you a second chance. And it was that, I just got goosebumps. It was that willingness of another human being to trust me Right. And to give me a chance that really put me on the path to getting and staying sober. So until then I had, you know, I'd struggled, I'd go a few months and then I'd drink or I'd go a few months and then I'd get high or whatever. But it was like, this person is staking their reputation on me and I cannot screw this up. And so would I, would I, would it have been easier for me maybe to put the pieces back together without a felony on my record? Absolutely. Um, would it have been easier to not live in the ghetto and hear gunshots from my porch and have people get stabbed in my apartment building here uh, in Austin? Would it have been better to not live in an area like that? Uh, yeah, 
it would have been. But those things also provided me an opportunity to learn how to be in recovery and to stand on my own two feet, no matter what the circumstances were. And that I believe has made me a better and stronger person. So thank you. Um, So the 90 days that you were in prison and the um, time that it took to get your case to court, were you offered treatment at all during that time period? Or yes. support for, okay. And Oh yeah, I mean, I was encouraged to go to 12 step programs. Um, I in was prison too? Yeah, we had um, in prison, there was an NA meeting, an AA meeting. There was a Bible study. Um, there were a lot of things that were offered in the prison if you wanted to. And that was super duper important. If your employer had said, Erica, oh my gosh, we discovered what you're doing. We're not going to press charges, but you're going to lose your job. Like this is serious. You know, you've hit bottom. What do you think would have, like, do you think you would have been able to get uh sort of the initiative to and it's not initiative I mean addiction's hard like I yeah. if, if it were easy more people would do it were you know like I I, I get it so mm-hmm. I'm just wondering that, what, yeah oh sorry for interrupting no just like what that would have looked like I mean losing your job and being caught is one thing mm-hmm. yeah I would say that that would not have been a bottom. Okay. If you, if you remove the consequences for the behavior, you've now, the way I describe it is you lower the bottom so that people have to fall even further down before they get to the point where they hit a stopping point and then have to make a different decision. So the more consequences you remove for that kind of behavior, the more you lower the bottom and the worse things have to get for people before they have an impetus to change their behavior and get help. Denial is definitely thick, right? Like it's hard to break through that. Oh yeah. And that's the thing is people will ask me, I get asked all the time, Erica, you know, my brother-in-law committed suicide because of his addiction. How did, how did you get it? Or, you know, my uncle, um, is living on the street. Why did you get it? And he didn't. And, and what I always say to people is, I don't know. Um, hitting, going to prison wasn't my bottom, to be honest with you, but it definitely brought me closer to the bottom. So I had to hit an emotional bottom where I wanted to die basically. And I like, So going to prison was like eye opener, right? It was like, oh my God, this is not good. I don't want to live my life like this. These people are crazy. And this is what I'm in for, right? So it was like, it was like the the fog kind of started to clear with that. But then I never, but with that, I didn't deal with why I was using drugs and how I got to that point. I wasn't addressing the hurt on the inside that led me there, right? So there was a process of, of reaching that bottom, just having to decide that I wanted something different, being offered another choice and then making that choice. But if I had never been to prison, if I had never had to really suffer for what I did, things would have had to get get far worse for me before I would have done anything different. Thank you for, for, thank you, Barbara. Uh, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Would, would, yes, it, be, uh, would it be uh, fair to assume that uh, somebody who did lose their job, uh, that may be a bottom for them where they, uh, they make the change and somebody else may have to go to prison to, to experience, I guess, the, I don't know if it'd be the same emotional thing, but just to get them to the point where it's time to change? I suppose it's possible for sure. Yeah. But that's not really a consequence because I can just go back out and get another job today. Sure, sure. 
But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not the person who can say what someone's bottom will be. Right, right. Um, yeah. Anyway, we have, uh, uh, we have a pretty long history here in uh, House Judiciary as, as far as expungement goes. Um, and, and I look at it as a positive thing. Uh, the, the first uh, the first expungement that I remember, is I came onto this committee seven years ago, and we had a guy named uh, Tony Longines, who uh, was pretty much a uh, advocating for himself um, for a period of time. And we ended up passing, as far as like I said, uh, my first expungement bill, and uh, you know that helped him out. You know, as a seventeen year old. A uh, foolish 17 year old, he, uh, you know, him and some buddies broke into some camps, you know, type thing mm -hmm. and, you know, basically stole trinkets and, and whatever. And, and, uh, and all his buddies, all his buddies got off and he, uh, he was charged with a felony. And at 50, early 50s, uh, you know, he came in uh, advocating for himself uh, to uh, have his uh, conviction expunged. And his main reasoning for it was he was a carpenter. And he half the year he worked in Alaska and he had to fly to Alaska because he had a felony and couldn't go into um, go into Canada. So anyway, uh, after everything, everything worked out and we, we passed the lot, he had it expunged. He got to drive to Canada, or got to drive to Alaska. Um, and the next year he came back in and sat in the witness chair and cried uh, just because of that that simple thing. He's, he was able mm -hmm. to drive drive to work but um i've uh um i've benefited from expungement as a uh as a 21 year old um i got a dui and uh and and again i, I kind of advocated for myself a few years ago or anybody else in the same situation it seems like if somebody had a, a dui in, in in whatever number of years went by for me at the time it was 40 years um, and, and it seems like maybe, you know, on some level that could go away because chances are uh, of somebody reoffending after 40 years is probably pretty slim. But um, just a, just another situation where we you know, done something and done some good as far as expungement goes, um, you know, you know, with a license thing, it could potentially, uh, you know, stop somebody from getting a job driving or, or whatever. So, um, you know, I, I have high hopes for this bill. Of course, you can't make any promises at this point, but um, I, I certainly look at your, uh, um, um, you know, your crime that you committed uh, to me is something that that could and should be expunged. Um, I, I don't think uh, to me when, when somebody is convicted of a crime, um, you know, once once jail sentences are, are, you know, if that's what it is, are served. Fines are uh, are paid. Restitution is made. Uh, to me, um, it doesn't make sense to punish somebody for life. They've gone through their punishment, and it, it's it's time for the punishments to go away. But but anyway, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Yes. Hi, Erica. I'd like to uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your your testimony. Uh, I commend you for taking full responsibility for your actions during this very trying time in your life. Uh, but having been someone now who has experienced this and has uh, gone through, uh, for lack of a better term, the embarrassment of going through the court system and, and being incarcerated and so on and so forth. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to look at S7 or actually look at the language in the bill, but having been someone uh, who has experienced this now, in your own opinion, do you think that if they were, if this were to happen again, not to say that it's going to Erica, that's not what I'm implying whatsoever, but do you think that a, a person or person should be allowed more than one opportunity for expungement if they haven't learned from their first time? No. Well, okay, let me, let me make sure I'm clear what your question is. So if what I heard you ask me <laughs> is if someone continues to demonstrate criminality should they be offered expungement? Yes, basically, if, if you're if you're convicted of a crime and mm -hmm. you've you've done your, I believe it's uh, roughly five years without a similar offense or any other offenses, then I, I believe for certain offenses you're eligible for expungement. Which I agree. I think everyone deserves a second chance. I agree with that wholeheartedly. 
But after that five years and that first expungement, the question, I guess, in your own personal opinion is, do you think that that person, if committing another offense, should be uh, eligible for another expungement charge? I do not. Um, and, and personally, I don't think five years is long enough to demonstrate uh, recovery from whatever behavior it is. Uh, that's, that's my personal opinion. I think if somebody has, if it's 10 years from the date of conviction, and that this was my recommendation when I was testifying before the Senate committee, was if you say, you know, five years from discharge or five years from conviction, those are very different things because it took me, you know, 10 years before I was able to get my case discharged because I had to pay my restitution in full. And so I think 10 years from the date of conviction or the date of arrest or whatever I think is, is reasonable. But if you're continuing to demonstrate criminality, you should not be granted further benefits of the court. Uh, the purpose to me of an expungement is you have demonstrated that you have been rehabilitated from whatever behavior it was that had you get arrested in the first place. And so I, for me, as an example, if I'm sitting here asking you for an expungement from uh, something I was convicted, arrested in 2005, convicted in 2006, it's now 2021. If I had been, if I'd committed another crime five years, you know, in 2010 and 2015, well, I haven't really demonstrated that I can be trusted, especially if it's the same crime. For goodness sake, if I was continuing to commit embezzlement, you absolutely should not expunge my record because I am a danger to the people that I'm working for and with. And people deserve the right to know what is up with people. That's my personal opinion. Did I answer your question? You did. I want to thank you, Erica. I respect your opinion, and I wish you you and your family well going forward in the future. Thank you, sir. I want to make sure I'm not missing any, any other committee members. Great. Thank you. So um, I should have your email. If not, I know our committee assistant, Evan, does, and, um, and I'll be in touch. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, committee. Yeah. Thank you. Really, really appreciate you spending the time with us. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Take good care. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, Pat just, and Pat is ready. Good afternoon, Pat. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, House Judiciary Committee. So nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We haven't seen you much. I know. Seen... Long time no see. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Great. So we, we do have documents posted to, um, to support your testimony. And um, are there other folks that are testifying with you? I feel good. Um... Well, Terry Scott uh, is accompanying me. And Judge Gerson, if he could get away, was going to be available. And, the okay. reason, and the re I guess I should say for your record, I'm Patricia Gable, I'm the Vermont State Court Administrator, and I was invited today uh, regarding S7, uh, and I assumed that the invitation was related to the uh, fiscal impact, but I wasn't sure, because as you know, I, I'm not the one who's been uh, following S7. So Terry Scott, our, our Chief of our Trial Court Operations, is available uh, on the technical issues. Yes, and that, that, would, be, that would be helpful to your um, fiscal impact is, as well. So. so shall I say something? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're always, you're always welcome to. Okay. Testify, but if, yeah. you prefer to, if you prefer to um, pass to Terry, would yeah, so, let's understand the impact, the impact of S7 um, on, on the judiciary is, is really what, what we need to understand. Right, so um, what I provided to you is a copy of the Judiciary Pandemic Response and Recovery Plan, which um, I've discussed informally um, with uh, Representative Squirrel in the House and Senator Sears in the Senate, uh, but until today, uh, I hadn't put it in final form. And this is a proposal 
um, uh, for a request of funds for the way that the judiciary would be able to um, respond to the pandemic, which is currently still uh, ongoing and still having an impact on the court system, but also to recover from the pandemic. And uh, those of your members who have a chance to look at the plan will see that it's a, a comprehensive plan um, that uh, identifies uh, ways we could deal with um, the restrictions that we still have. Uh, we've always been open in some way, which means that we've continued to have access to justice in the judiciary. However, uh, due to the impacts of the pandemic, uh, there have been times when we've been completely physically closed, where we we're only doing hearings remotely, uh, for example, either by video or audio, or other times where even though we are holding emergency in-person hearings, uh, we are still um, uh, restricted in terms of where personnel are located. And um, I think you may know from the legislature's experience doing video, that video is a, it's a, um, on the one hand, it's a real godsend to be able to continue to do operations. But on the other hand, it means that everything that we do takes longer. Uh, it's this very linear path. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, we really uh, got a whole group together in the judiciary to take a look at what it would take for us to start expanding uh, the way we are conducting our operations. And that includes both um, we're uh, starting to get courthouses cleared for um, doing jury trials again, and that's been very challenging with ventilation. Uh, and we're um, uh, learning and continuing to try and learn how to use our existing technology uh, to um, expedite proceedings, to find more efficient ways of doing things. And expungements are part of that package because as you know, we have already had legislation passed. And so we do have uh, backlogs in our expungement uh, work that the judiciary needs to do. And we also anticipate uh, if S7 becomes law, that uh, that will simply expand the number of uh, expungements. And so as I provide in my plan, we have both an operational plan and a financial plan, which if we do get the um, ARPA funding to, or any funding, but ARPA is the one that we hope to receive, uh, that using those additional resources, that will not only help us deal with our current backlog and expungements, but it will also help us during the pandemic respond to any new legislation uh, that may be passed. And you'll see when you have an opportunity to look at the plan that we are going to be uh, trying to use the lean process that I think your committee's heard about before uh, to find ways um, to streamline uh, the way we do expungements. And so I know you've heard testimony before that the, uh, uh, with, we've got records in, on paper, we've got records on microfiche. For all I know, we've got records carved in stone, <laughs> how far they go back in the archives. But wherever they are, uh, when we're doing expungements, we have to find ways to address those. And so right now, uh, for those uh, files that are not totally on the new Odyssey system, it's a, a fairly time-consuming and laborious process uh, to do expungements. But even uh, when we get through the five-year look-back period and, and the files still are, you know, so they're on Odyssey, uh, it will streamline. Fortunately, the technology will help improve that. Um, uh, there are still a couple of manual things that and clerk review that still needs to be done for expungements. But once we're past that five-year look-back period and out of the um, out of the uh, backlog of expungements, uh, we'll we'll be much better able to provide the services that the legislature would like us to provide uh, to carry out the policies. That's great, thank you, thank you. And I, I've spoken with Senator Sears um, as well um, about if there's possibility to, to get some of that, um, that relief money to the judiciary to help with things like expungements and backlog, backlogs and um, 
and access to justice certainly priorities of our committee. Great, and I well, we uh, welcome any questions about any part of that proposal, but um, we know that expungements are an important policy uh, of the state of Vermont and for important policy reasons. And uh, if we can get the resources, we'd like to you know, play our part. <laughs> Thank you, no, I appreciate that. Uh, Barbara. Um, hi, Pat, so uh, nice to see you. Yeah, so I know that I was confused about this new software and what that would do. So there's no sort of scanning old papers into the, si the system or, I mean, I, I guess scanning when entering them, it would be the case, but can you give up us a sense of how many convictions um, there are and roughly how many there possibly could be that would get expunged? I mean, I realize, and by that, I realize you don't know what laws are gonna pass, but I'm assuming, if it's a certain amount of years ago, somebody isn't alive anymore, or? We, we've had some of those. <laughs> yes. Th Terry's a better witness okay. on that issue, I think. Terry, uh, if you're on, uh, perhaps you could comment on what your anticipation is, what your review shows. Sure. Um, <clears throat> So our last, our legacy case management system went back to 1991. Um, and then prior to that, everything was handwritten and all of that information is still held up at public records. Uh, things after that are pre-1945 and back um, end up over in the archives. I've been working the last, oh my gosh, like five or more years, actually, I've been on the records management committee and one of our goals is to get, is to update the disposition uh, guidelines for records. So in 2007, well, I think it happened before then, they were, they were started microfilming back in the late eighties, early nineties. And, and so all of those cases that are on microfish now or microfilm <clears throat> are, um, you know, th those were done by the Department of Buildings and Grounds at that time. So having been one who has searched diligently to find old records when we're looking for a case to expunge or for other information, they were basically handed, you know, into a pile and they just would shoot the paper through. So it's done by years, but it's not necessarily done alphabetically or by docket number. And so it's really often difficult. Um, they, they tried to have a, um, a starting page, which people used to handwrite as they boxed up old files. Um, and some of that has been helpful. Um, but I have to tell you, Viserra is a wonderful, wonderful agency to work with. And they've been a lot of help for us. They've even um, given the uh, Chittenden Division one of their film readers so that we can expedite some of these older cases when we find them. Um, everything else uh, from, from uh, so at that time, all of the, all of the um, dis disposition orders say, put it on microfilm, destroy the paper file. So those old paper files are gone. The problem I think I've explained in other years with the microfilm is there's no way to get it off. When we, we started doing small numbers of expungement, they used to take a little X-Acto knife and try to scrape the case off the file, off the film. And that was just not sustainable. And it also sometimes ran into the next file on the film. So it was really- A bonus for that person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, 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 and difficult for, um, for you know the film to hold up well. So um, in 2007 is when they decided to stop. It, it, it became too unwieldy. Um, there are some big reels. Sometimes it takes one of the Vicera staff hours and hours to get into the middle of one of those going through um, clip by clip to find the correct files. So, um, so We've moved on from there starting in 2007, but we've boxed up those files. So we take up, I wanna say Tanya Marshall told us like at least 25% of the, of the um, space up at the record center. 
So in there, you know, I mean, it's not unusual when you think about, you know, Chittenden County probably does a little over 2,000 criminal cases a year. They're our biggest. How many? I'm sorry, say that again. 1,000 criminal okay. cases a year. Um, and so filings that we have to retain those records. So, and then as you go on around the state, and I don't have the exact number, Chittenden always stands out for me because it's our biggest court. Um, but even our smaller courts, you know, are apt to have over a thousand cases. Um, I was the clerk in Windsor, and I think we ran around twelve to fifteen hundred criminal filings a year. Um, and that's that going way back. It was a thousand a year too. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's probably increased over the years as we've added more charge codes. You know, we've built the systems up, and more okay. charges. You know, drug trafficking and all of those things that have been added over the years. And the state's attorneys provide us with new charge codes annually. So we're, we're constantly adding, um, adding those to the criminal division. So, so there's, a, there's a big backlog. And when you expand the case type, like S7 is going to do, um, so it's the question is, is, are these all going to be retroactive? So we will go right. back you know, just much like the person who testified earlier, you can see what a difference this will make in her life. You know, we're going to go back and look at all of those cases um, or people can be able to petition. Um, and Terry, I'm assuming Vermont isn't like an anomaly that other states have the same issues. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Pat, you had talked at one point about having contact with the other, like are other states finding um, just other ways of addressing it? Because there's been so much expungement in our country that I'm just wondering how. Some are how sealing that, cases. Yeah. You know, some are, um, I think Judge Gerson had spent some time and I thought he might be on, but uh, that, you know, across the country, they've been looking at sealing cases um, I'm not sure how they're retaining those. Some have been ahead of us as far as a case management system that can then retain those sealed files, which is something Odyssey would do. Um, right. I know we had two years ago when we uh, got the expungement um, legislation, it was a couple of different steps, which makes it a lot more confusing um, and a lot more tracking for court staff or state's attorneys too. So um, I think we're, I think we've been paring it down. Um, the legislation looks much more simplified. You know, it's after those five year periods. Um, you know, I think they're still looking at whether, you know, what the state's attorney's discretion is as to whether or not they want to view every single case. Um, and then, you know, once we've expunged them, we have to notify VCIC, uh, which is Jeff Wallen shop. And I know that, you know, he has said it takes two sets of eyes in his shop because he's also sending this out nationally. So, so there's right. a lot of steps that have to be followed. But like Pat noted, the nice thing about Odyssey now is that we have a, we have a functionality in there that will help us to do that the record totally out of yeah out of the system so so i've got one last question which my committee mates may or may not like but um would it be easier if we said everything from x year back is expunged like in some ways i'm thinking if somebody hasn't committed another crime since uh Definitely, you, I was trying to look back at the years that you said, let's say 1960 or something. Would that be easier? Because you were just getting rid of the whole stack of microfiche at that point for those years. Um, yeah, I mean, but again, you got to look and see what's on all those pieces of microfiche. <laughs> um, okay, I just wondered that, if... I think, yeah, I think yeah. the easy thing with the microfiche is that when we get a docket number that we've expunged, you know, instead of trying to scrape it up, Vicera is working with us to keep a, um, you know, an index so that if somebody requests a record, you would know we would have to, how we would respond. You know, you would look up that as far as the expungement list, just like we're doing with all of our expunged cases now. We're keeping those indexes, so we're pretty clear that you know things. There's no record. We and just, I think. And Terry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Judge Gerson has 
advocated for coming up with ways to deal with the status of cases that's different from actually right. physically doing something to them. Right. He did mention that. He did definitely mention that. Yeah, and that so that's one option which would make it much easier for, you know, when, you know, the law would say when we're asked, do you have a file about John Doe? Our answer is no, we have no file on John Doe because we're told, you know, that that's the status. So that's one opportunity is to continue to look at those kind of solutions. Right. And the other opportunity is in our proposal, which is we're going, if we get funded uh, as requested, we'll be doing a review of a lot of business processes, including this one. And I think that's an opportunity where instead of just an anecdotal review of what other states may be doing, it might enable us to do a more um, you know, deliberate uh, uh, review of the other ways that states are dealing with this, particularly regarding files uh, that aren't fully electronic. Um, right. so there's a couple of different ways, I think, for us to tackle that. Thank you very much for giving me all that background. That's really helpful. Thanks. Uh, Kate. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. And I, so sort of like my, it's tricky being a new member and stepping into these issues that you guys have clearly been working on for a while. So I apologize if my questions are redundant or maybe if there are questions that will be addressed in a different committee. But I, I just have a couple questions about the proposal. So um, this is what I think I'm hearing, and, may, and let me know if this is if this isn't accurate. So part of what I think I'm hearing is, you know, once the sort of like new, I think it's called Odyssey system is up and running for a while, after five years or beyond, you know, assuming people within the system have been maybe all of their history is encapsulated within the new system. The notion is that it'll be a much easier process. And so I guess my first question is the team that's being proposed is the idea that that sort of group of people that you are currently requesting that that would change or shift after, you know, five to 10 years, that this is really like a, an interim effort to try to get things moving along, or is the notion that this team that's being requested would, would sort of be an ongoing, um, group? So that, that's an excellent question, because one of the things that we had to do when we considered what would it really take for us to really do what we need to do, and what I said to my team when we were putting this together is the ARPA money is one-time money, and so fortunately now it's expanding a number of years because the CARES Act money, which we did spend, but my Lord, it was, it's hard to spend a lot of money <laughs> fast that way. And it means that you have to um, carry out initiatives uh, in a much faster way than you normally would. So, so you'll see when you have a chance to actually review the report that uh, we actually build in a kind of special vacancy savings component into the different spreadsheets uh, at the end. And uh, we have a ramp up piece, but then uh, we also have a ramp down uh, over a period of 12 months. And so most of the positions that are uh, in there related to expungement, uh, we, those are limited service positions and it's not our intention to keep those. There may be a few. Uh, I think when you look at the ramp down, uh, there's maybe a, a little over a half a million dollars that might be in there as a legacy for things we need to do. But of course, that's also four years down the road. And so we felt that wasn't an unreasonable uh, estimate, if you will, you know, recognizing that it's pretty hard now to really anticipate what, you know, what'll finally be happening. So the, the um, manpower, the docket clerks, we have a 13 or 14 docket clerks in there. That's really intended to be limited service to deal with this period when we still have a lot of people on paper, you know, the files that we have for people. Um, and our anticipation is that um, we will, you know, as we start to come to the end of the spending capacity of that money, then uh, not use those positions anymore. And the, the way we deal with that is because they're limited service positions, even those, though those employees have benefits and the like, they know that it's a time limited uh, uh, job. 
Thanks. And just to get a little clarity, is is this this team of folks like is is this to address primarily the COVID backlog, or how much of this is related to? I guess maybe I'm trying to get a sense of like have changes in Vermont law, or is the notion that upcoming changes potentially in Vermont law will cause some like boom in expungements, or is this specifically related to backlogs related to COVID? Or I'm curious sort of how those things relate to one another. So the, um, uh, and, I, and I realized you probably haven't had my report to have much chance to look at it, but let me see if I can pull it up um, right now while we're talking. So um, the, you know, obviously the expungement legislation has, you know, we've been sort of um, looking at over the last few years but most recently, um, there's been a, an increase. And the, the pandemic, the reason the pandemic is a contributing factor is we were already you know, quite challenged to manage you know, um, the expungements, even under normal timetables. But once the pandemic hit, that suddenly all the things we did uh, stopped. And as you know, there are certain kinds of emergency cases that were required by statute uh, to put our resources to. And so the, um, the pandemic has really um, created a significant backlog that we really need to address. So the report that I gave you covers many more things than expungements <laughs> that are the causes of the pandemic, but the expungements are one of the case types and in particular, um, the, uh, the labor intensive nature of the paper and microfilm records uh, that um, we hope over time will become less of an impact. I don't know if that answered your question. And, and I, I, don't know you, yeah, I don't know for you how um, the pandemic and uh, real life is already challenging, but the pandemic is a whole new dimension. <laughs> Yeah, and I had looked at the expungement section of your report, and I and it brought up the question for me of like, you know, to what to what extent are we estimating the staff impact that expungement law will have? You know, like how, how is that being factored into to the work that y'all will have to do? Um, I guess the last question I had was, um, it looks like the the last section of this bill uh, is requesting a commission on looking at the process of expungements and making it more efficient and, and sort of like how, how to work with it in general. And so I guess I'm just curious how the request that you presented sort of align with that commission. Like, does it like, it's actually it be working in concert or? Yes, it's, a, it's actually very much in alignment because the commission, um, you know, the commission could look at other states or what have you, but really it's in the judiciary <laughs> where we have to make sure that, uh, you know, our um, practices and rules regarding integrity of records and our technologies uh, and changing law, uh, where even if a commission was given this mandate, they would be having to work with us very closely. So if we have uh, the resources we've requested and particularly the availability of the lean process where we're already saying, let's take a look at this, then, then um, I think it's, we're, we would be partners in that is the way I would see that. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think Kate, you're referring to the Sentencing Commission. Are you, are you looking at section eight? Um, and we will, we do have written testimony from Judge Zones that, that the time frame, the November 1st time frame is workable and, um, and so I think that would be very helpful. Um, although I do have questions about the effective date of this date and the report. Because um, I think the effective date might be on July 1 and then the report report isn't due until November. So we we'll need to think about, <laughs> about that. I hope that we get um, permission to spend resources in a timely way so we can be good partners on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other uh, 
committee members and I and Judge Grierson is here and is welcome to to comment and also to pass but uh, good afternoon yeah good afternoon uh, for the record Brian Grierson Chief Superior Judge I don't have a lot to add to my testimony from last week but in response to um, Representative Rachelson's question about other states. The problem is that, um, as in so many areas of, of criminal procedure, it, it's really apples and oranges. I mean, it, you can't compare, it's difficult to compare one state's process to another. And we have a system that calls for obviously sealing and expungement. I mean, we have made some progress in the last few years in the sense that we've done away with the idea that we physically have to destroy records. We clarified that under either procedure, the response uh, is no record exists. Um, and whether it's viewed as a big step or a small step, it's a step that uh, certainly uh, lifted a burden from, from the court and any other entity that has these records to find a way to dispose of them. But following up on the, the comment by Representative Donnelly and the chair, the Sentencing Commission did meet yesterday um, and we spoke about this and we've formed a, a committee that is essentially the same group of individuals who have been working on this subject, myself and uh, Defender General, and, uh, Attorney General's office and certainly the state's attorney's office. Um, we would include um, Jeff Wallen or somebody from VCIC because they're the other prong of this, of this project. Um, and we hopefully will, I think everyone in that group recognizes the need to transform this system in some fashion. How we do that, I guess, is what remains to be seen. I think with the introduction of Odyssey, it does give us more options than we had previously. Um, and, and I think that's where we will begin to explore this, what I, what I would hope is that, that we could have a system, and I, you can call it sealing or expungement, but the idea would be that once it's in the system, we can try to make more the finality of it more automatic in the sense that um, we can look at time frames, how long you want to keep files open, uh, how long are these files going to be accessible, who is going to be able to access them, and how. Um, and if we can focus on those questions, um, that, that's my hope that we can, um, I don't think it will ever be fully automatic. Um, if the committee remembers last week when I was talking about the uh, Judicial Bureau and, and cleaning up uh, those records, I, I'm still working with the Judicial Bureau and a DMV over trying to come up with some language that they both understand. More important that they understand than me. Um, so uh, they, I know they've met this week and I know they're going to continue to talk. So hopefully we'll have something on that, but it still is always going to require staff involvement, um, to verify that the case, even if appropriate from a time frame, is ready to be permanently sealed is, I guess the phrase I like to use or that no one will have access. Are there any intervening steps that have to be taken? Is it a predicate offense? Um, have there been intervening charges? Some of that will come through our, our Odyssey system. In other words, if there are pending cases for that same individual, we can readily access those. But whether or not the state has the burden of coming forward and objecting uh, to a otherwise uh, a case that's otherwise ready to be expunged, that's one of the real issues we have to grapple with. Um, on the, on the back end, on the front end, and I know I've testified to this before, so I, I won't belabor the point, but we need to work with the Department of Corrections, for instance. We're not at this point informed when someone completes their sentence. If they pay a fine to our system, yes, we have that information, but anybody that's on probation or served a, a incarcerated sentence and maybe on furlough status, when they're discharged, when they've completed that process, we are not necessarily uh, involved or notified, more importantly. So we don't know when the triggering event for final complete 
non-disclosure begins without uh, adding that step to the process, which obviously puts a burden on, on DOC now that, uh, that would be that they do not have at this time. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I would like to think that um, we can certainly uh, improve the, the current system and make it less labor intensive, but there's always going to be that human element at some level. Um, so that's really all I have at this point, but I'll be glad to answer any questions that committee members may have. Great, and thank you, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, see, Bob, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Maxine, is this the only day we're gonna get to ask questions on, on S7 here or with the testimony or we're gonna have other days or? Yes, we, we will have other days. This is, this is complicated. <laughs> so okay. yeah, and we'll have more versions of the, of the bill. So yes. Okay, then I won't, I won't beleaguer this. My question actually was, was gonna go back to uh, uh, Pat in reference to uh, a lot of the positions and, and so on and so forth. If we're gonna take testimony again, I guess we can, we can handle it then or? Well, no, go out there here and, <laughs> and her colleagues are here. So I, I would say um, it's, it's a good time to ask. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm looking at all these positions, Pat, and so on and so forth. And I see where you are uh, thinking about evening hours and, and quite possibly weekends also for these. Is it just for expungement cases, I take it? or No, no and, I, and I have to be careful. <clears throat> um, that's something we would look at as a possibility. Uh, but as I also mentioned in there, that um, uh, that we would only go forward on something like that if um, all the stakeholders, not just external stakeholders, but internal stakeholders, uh, were on board on that. Um, so I, I think it's important to say because Judge Gerson and I have talked about that, and he looked at me when I said night court and <laughs> weekend court. I just wanted to make that clarification that that is one thing we would consider if others thought it was a good way to go through. Okay, well, well we do have it on TV. They have that court on TV, but obviously <laughs> uh, But I was, I was curious if in fact, uh, I'm looking at staying away from the IT stuff because I'm not even going to get into that stuff, obviously. Yeah. But looking at, uh, uh, I don't know, page, page nine, uh, retired judges, docket clerks, court officers, uh, $110,000 for the first year. Are you referring simply to the courtroom officers in that particular case? So uh, page nine is the summary of all the different initiatives. But yes, when you see those, uh, like for the um, bringing retired judges back, for example, and if we did have extended hours, uh, that's meant for uh, to say that we would need that much FTE uh, to cover uh, work we're doing beyond what our normal complement is right now. And so if in fact you get to the point, Pat, where we do have uh, court in the evening hours on weekends or whatever, are the court doors going to be open to the public? Uh, they would have to be to let the people in <laughs> if, if we were having hearings, right? So you could also have a situation where there could be internal judiciary work being done in the building that didn't <clears throat> involve um, external players. And if the building's locked uh, and there aren't security issues because it's off hours, then you wouldn't necessarily need security officers for people just to be in their workplaces if it's a safe workplace without that. But if you're talking about um, bringing people into the building at that time, then of course you would need that. Well, well I'm looking I'm looking at it. I can't find it. I'm sure you can point, point it out to me as if in fact the, uh, the facility is open, the courtrooms are open and the front door is open, where would I find uh, additional uh, uh, screeners along with the, any floors yeah, or so, whatever? Yeah, so, um, hold on a second. And I'm happy to take more security officers. I'd love anyone to advocate that we get more security positions. But, uh, I'm just scrolling in my document here. So, um, yeah, so on page three, You'll see that's where we talk about, you know, potentially bringing in retired judges, mm -hmm. and um, and you'll see that it includes um, court, two additional court officers. 
uh, with potential for differential pay for staff people as well if they're asked to work extended uh, hours. So your court officers are basically right now state employees who work within the courtrooms, correct? Uh, not necessarily, no. Um, they can be. The court officer is in the courtroom, but um, it could be someone who's an employee. It could be a sheriff serving as a court officer. Terry Scott is much more familiar with the security needs. Terry, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, <clears throat> sure. So when we're holding hearings, we always have a security officer, courtroom officer. And then um, anytime our doors are open, we have screeners. Some, some of the larger courts have more than one screeners. I wanna say Chittenden and um, Washington, Windsor, there's some that have state employees that are um, security officers in the courtroom. Otherwise we contract with the sheriff's department um, for our front door security. We typically, in smaller courts, maybe there's one security person doing the screening. Right. On a day where we had a jury draw or a large number of cases, we would have two on duty there to keep screening moving forward. So your your $110,000 for court officers in fiscal year 22 includes your courtroom officer, your screener, potentially uh, uh, someone assigned to the jury? So, so what it does, and, and these are um, sort of expansion estimates. Um, and so these are the additional resources we think we would need. Obviously, depending on uh, what was happening that day, and if you did decide to do extended hours, uh, you might do it in a way that people just have a different work day. Uh, so, um, you know, these are kind of estimates. What, what do we think we would need to make this happen? But we might need more. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sure as we delve into it further there, I'll, I'll have more questions, given more opportunity to review your, your 10 page uh, written testimony here. But thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I, and I would uh, you know, love to you know, sit down at a meeting and, and any areas where you think that we didn't think it through carefully enough, we'd love to know about that so that we can improve it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Selena. Yeah, I'm just, I'm still digesting um, your report, which is really, really helpful, just about your recovery plan and knowing that, you know, we have huge backlogs in so many areas of your work. So I really appreciate the opportunity to take a look at that. And, um, and I apologize if this is redundant with other folks' questions or with anything in the plan. I've been kind of like listening along, looking at the plan. Um, but I know we, we not that long ago funded some additional positions for expungement work. And I believe those are still, we're still funding those, right? Like we didn't. I'm not sure about that. And again, I'd have to ask Terry, you, uh, we got funding for temporary yep. positions. Yeah, for expungement work. right. We had five temps for the five geographic regions. And I believe those have all completed their work. Uh, you know, or, or completed their time, not the work. <laughs> okay, so those are those positions are what what did those positions do when expungement stopped during the pandemic? So those were temp positions. I think um, most of them are um, not with us anymore. So that we have we. And I, and I think Terry, didn't you get? Weren't you able to do some expungements during the pandemic? Oh, oh during the pandemic, yes. Yes, we have continued as, you know, um, legal aid and the AG's office worked together to have a couple of expungement clinics. Um, so we had those coming in. We were also working on the backlog of the, and I think Pat, this is in the report. There was, you know, um, the uh, diversion cases. I think there was around 15,000 of those. And I think we're down to like eight. Um, so, so when there was time, we have continued to work on those. and also ongoing, we have folks who are in deferred sentences. So when their sentence is up, part of that deferral is that they then get their case expunged. And so we've, we've continued to keep up with those. So when those dates come up, you know, they're automatically expunged as, as the result of the closing of their sentence, they've completed their sentence. Um, and then last year with the marijuana uh, convictions, we had started those um, after I think that 
bill passed in October. So we've been slowly working on those when there's been time and availability for people to do those, so. So even though the administrative order kind of put a pause on expungements, you've been continuing to do them when you can and use, Some of them, and use yeah. these temporary positions to I just I know I I've always wondered about that because we we sort of said like we're not going to do expungements anymore but then we were still funding those positions during some of that time and I just wondered yeah so it sounds like so, some of that work has still continued even the yeah with the marijuana convictions there were so many of them and we just because it's got the timeline to January of 22 um, and so I think people were feeling a little angst about getting too far behind that, you know, to catch up on those things, so. Yeah, I remember asking Greg Mosley, who's our chief of finance and administration, whether we still had any more capacity there, and apparently we um, don't. In other words, we use that, the resource you kindly granted us well. <laughs> um, okay. But we, uh, it's not there anymore. Okay. There were tons. Okay, so we're sort of starting from we're starting from almost from scratch with assessing the. Well, with this caveat, it, it, with this caveat, um, the positions that are in this uh, proposal, uh, some of them, I think, thirty-eight of those positions are extensions of the um, CARES Act limited service positions we had, and so right now we have a number of limited service positions not related to expungement but just related to operations generally uh, related to the emergency funding we got. And we're looking, the positions we're requesting in this report are extending the ones we got and then adding some. And then, as I mentioned, as we get to the end of the funding, we phase out uh, the use of those positions because we don't want to end up with a cliff, a resource cliff where, you know, we're still relying on them. And, um, you know, I had a, the Supreme Court and I had a, a long discussion about that because I realized that uh, for us to be able to deliver on this report, which is not only ramp up, which is harder than you would think, you know, to start hiring people and spending all that money, but also to have the discipline to ramp down. Uh, and that means uh, that it has to be managed like a formal project. You need to have formal project management and you need to have those, you know, timetables fixed. So not only are you dealing, you know, humanely with people who, um, you know, have come to you to work for this limited period, but there's always the opportunity as well as we learn more and more about how we can use our technology, that there may be some things we learned during this period where we would want to make some of those new positions permanent, but at the same time, there may be existing positions in the judiciary that are obsolete. And so when you, you don't let people go, but what you do is if you get a vacancy in a position that's become obsolete, then that's another way of ramping down. And, and that's why this program, if we're funded for it, will you know, include somebody doing formal project management of it to make sure that um, even though it's a multi-year project that we, you know, we have timetables and deadlines. And, we learned that within the judiciary uh, with the case management system project, which is like a five, you know, when we started with the funding was like seven years ago, but, you know, really a five-year project. And so we had to practice formal project management and governance. For that. And, and this would be like that. It's a substantial amount of money to request, and it's a big responsibility and a duty to, um, uh, you know, manage it well, be good stewards of that funding and, uh, and manage, the, manage the positions down at the end. Great, thank you. I guess I still, I'm still, I think maybe, maybe I might, um, if you're up for it, I might just ask to try, I've always sort of struggled a little bit to understand how the expungement workflows and funding connect. And I don't want to take like all of the committee's time on it, but just I no, might we're, we're, try we're to find some to time with you if you are willing, just to make sure I really get it. Yeah, we're happy to meet with you, and Great. you wouldn't just want me because I'm I'm the person with the least subject matter expertise. <laughs> yeah. But as a team, we'd be happy. And as I said earlier, 
Um, this proposal we put together, but the more we have questions about it and challenges and the like, uh, it can always be revised as we, you know, have more insights that come to us from, you know, people who are asking thoughtful questions. There, there's a lot happening during the pandemic, and this is like one more thing. So we're doing our best to, to come up yeah. with a plan, but it could certainly benefit for from people taking a, a good look at it. And to be clear, I'm a I'm a big supporter of expungement and making sure you have the resources you need to do it. But I just wanna I just wanna make sure for myself I can see and understand that more clearly so I can be a good advocate too. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Any anybody else? Well, Selena, that would actually be very helpful. Um, I think if you um, if you did meet and then come back to us because because this is an important issue and we do want to um, move it forward um, and make sure that the judiciary is supported and um, and that we that we uh, pass go. <laughs> so okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, we still do need to hear from the Attorney General's office, but let's take a break. Uh, let's until three. Um, does that work for you, David? To come back at three? That's no problem. I'll see you okay. then.